You know when you're navigating somewhere using Google Maps and it will randomly show you driving on a completely different, often parallel road? Why does it do that? I mean, it's using GPS to know where you are, right? So why is it wrong? Well, let me explain a bit more about GPS, then talk about the tricks that Google uses to get around the limitations and ways to improve your GPS experience. So what is GPS? Well, that stands for Global Positioning System and is a term most commonly used when talking about the American system called Navstar. The American military created Navstar in the late 1970s, with the first satellite launching in February 1978. It was designed for a wide range of uses, but the key one was to allow intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, to hit their targets accurately. The system was designed to have 24 satellites orbiting the Earth once every 12 hours or so. The USA started letting civilians use the platform in the 1980s, but they weren't alone up there. Russia, specifically the USSR, launched GLONASS starting in 1982. They also have 24 satellites orbiting the Earth, although thanks to them being about a thousand kilometers lower, they orbit in 11 hours and 16 minutes. Since then, China, the EU, India and Japan have launched their own systems, although both the Indian and Japanese systems are up in geostationary orbit for better accuracy in their own regions. The European system, called Galileo, has been operational since 2016, with more launches scheduled, although the all 24 primary satellites are already in orbit and fully operational. So it's a whole load of satellites. Does that mean that your phone is communicating back and forth to them as they fly overhead? Well, not really. Your phone's GPS module doesn't transmit anything. There's pretty much no way you could fit a powerful enough transmitter into a phone to actively communicate with, well, anything in orbit. Instead, all it does is listen. Each satellite is outfitted with an atomic clock accurate to one nanosecond. Yeah, nano. It broadcasts the precise current timestamp as its message, and then your phone receives that message and can compare the current time to the timestamp embedded in the message and work out from that how far away the satellite is. If you repeat that with two other satellites, you can do what's called triangulation, or in this case, trilateration. The two other key pieces of data that your phone has are called the almanac and the ephemeris. The latter is stored in the message that each satellite broadcasts and tells you where that specific one is on its orbit when it sent that message. The almanac is general location information about all of the satellites, kind of roughly where you should find them. So if you take the point where the satellite said it was and calculate the distance, then that gives you a radius on the Earth of where you could possibly be. Add a second satellite's radius and you get a different one that should overlap with your, your first circle. And then you add a third and the point where all three of those circles meet is where you are. Now, since you don't have an atomic clock built into your phone, you actually need a fourth satellite to sync your clock to compare to. The more signals you receive and can compare, the better a fix of location data you can get. Now, the GPS chip in your phone is doing this check once per second or at one hertz. For the sorts of generally slow moving tracking the average person needs, this is decent enough, but it's far from perfect. For example, if you're driving on a national speed limit road here in the UK, like a motorway, you will have moved over 30 meters before your phone will check its location again. 30 meters is enough to miss a junction, and the faster you go, the less accurate it will be. On top of that, there is inherent inaccuracy in the GPS system. It's only accurate to within five meters as standard, although enhanced units can be accurate to up to 30 centimeters. GLONASS is accurate to be between two and four meters, although Galileo is accurate to within one meter for public use or an insane one centimeter on its encrypted channel. Either way, you're likely to be between one and five meters off, hence why Maps regularly shows a circle around your location until it can get a confirmed fix. So if Google Maps is only getting location updates once per second, 
and those updates can be up to five meters off. How does it work as well as it does? The short answer is data. Google is a data company. They have a whole lot of it and they leverage it to make maps better. That starts with data from your phone's accelerometer. If your phone doesn't feel a significant change in g-force, maps can assume that you haven't changed direction or speed and it will smoothly update the animation of you continuing on the road that it knows or at least thinks that you're on. To know which exact road you're on, of course, they use machine learning. They know what the speed limit of the road you're on is, they even show it to you, so if it's a choice between a dead-end residential 30 mile per hour road and a dual carriageway and you're plowing on at 70 miles an hour, it's probably going to pick the faster road. It's constantly doing a fitness test with the GPS and accelerometer data and its model for how you drive. And then there's the really smart bit. Everyone else who's using maps or just an Android phone with location services enabled are constantly broadcasting their GPS data back to Google servers. That's how it gets the live traffic data, although I should add that is fairly easy to manipulate as an artist in Berlin demonstrated with 99 phones in a little wagon, causing, according to maps, a horrendous traffic jam. Anyway, by using the other road user GPS data and comparing it to yours, maps can get a better fix on where exactly you are. But in the end, it's all just a big guess. Admittedly, a guess with a lot of data to back it up, but sometimes it gets it wrong, hence why I can think that you're driving on the wrong road, not showing you anywhere near your exit when you're practically on top of it, and the various other inaccuracies it displays. So how do we make it better? Well, the more data Google has, the better an experience you will have. Personally, I've seen it improve greatly over the last 10 or so years. And while its routing capabilities still infuriate me, like seriously, how many times have you been taken down a single track country lane when a perfectly good Joe carriageway exists and that only saves you one minute going that way instead? Oh, it's infuriating. But forgetting that part, the actual tracking it's doing pretty well. If you are having issues with it, you might want to make sure that your phone has direct line of sight to the sky, as any interference from your car's roof or your pocket or anything else can make the fix less accurate. You can also make sure that your device supports using multiple GPS sources. In my case, my OnePlus 7T Pro supports not only the American GPS, but also GLONASS and Galileo, among others. And if you need even more accuracy, say for tracking your lap times and lines around a racetrack or getting accurate 0 to 60 times, using a device with a higher refresh rate is key. This is a race box, a 10 hertz GPS receiver, meaning it's 10 times faster than my phone, getting updates every 100 milliseconds rather than once per second. That means that the data can be much more accurate, especially at high speed, as it can plot more points. Here's a visualization of that. Say you're driving around a corner at Donington, taking the peak racing line. Your phone's GPS would report, let's say, these dots. See how far they're spaced out? Now, you can draw a line through these to get a rough estimation of where you were, but that's going to include a lot of guesswork. Now look at the same corner tracked with the race box. Much more data points, meaning you can see exactly where you were with no guesswork involved. But if the race box is so much better with its 10 hertz receiver, why doesn't your phone use that as well? Well, odds are that's down to cost, size, and potentially even power consumption. The race box is a standalone unit and is relatively expensive, it's just shy of 300 pounds. And while you can buy a Draggy instead, which is also a 10 hertz uh, GPS receiver for tracking your 0 to 60s and lap times, and that is a bit cheaper and a bit smaller, it's still probably not cost effective for the normal phone companies to be sticking 10 hertz receivers in your phones at least yet anyway. So that's a brief explanation of how GPS works, the tricks that Google Maps uses, and the ways you can improve your experience. If you have any funny stories of GPS or Google Maps routing, feel free to leave those 
in the comments down below. Of course, if you have any questions, leave those down there too. If you want to stay up to date on videos from me, then hit that subscribe button and the bell notification icon. I post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with weekly live uh, sort of tech support chat live streams on a Thursday night. So make sure you tune into those. Also, if you want to support monetarily, then you can hit that YouTube join button for access to our Money Men Discord chat and sponsor free videos, or you can support on Patreon instead. There are also a whole load of other links in the description you can check out. There are Amazon and Overclock UK affiliate links if you're buying from there. There's merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other cool designs. And there's stuff like VPN options, Hubble Bundle and Streamlabs OBS, so feel free to check them out. I'll leave the Tech Explained playlist on the end if you want to learn more about the tech that we use on a pretty daily basis. And otherwise, hope you enjoy the video. Feel free to have any, uh, leave any questions you have in the comments down below. We'll see you on the next one.